Now on BBC One, later than scheduled, on the eve of the Northern Ireland referendum, David Dimbleby presents Ulster, The Choice. Good evening. It's decision day tomorrow for Northern Ireland as the province votes whether to accept or reject this document with its proposals for the future. Supporters see it as a way forward which will end the violence, opponents as a sellout. If accepted, it will lead to many changes here, elections for a new Northern Ireland Assembly, an all-Ireland council with limited powers, the early release of paramilitary prisoners, and in theory the handing in of terrorist weapons. And in addition, the South will give up its claim on the North and accept that a united Ireland won't happen unless the North votes for it. Tonight, on the eve of this important poll, we're going to be talking to some of the main protagonists for and against. And there'll be a phone-in on 5 Live immediately after the programme. The number to ring if you want to get involved in that is 0500 909 693. Now, listening to our five party leaders who'll be taking the floor here in turn and commenting on what they say, two very different communities here in Northern Ireland, and with them, Wendy Austin and Diana Medill. Diana. Here in Carrickfergus, we've brought together a range of people who have got unionist views. We're at Carrickfergus Castle, which is about 10 miles north of Belfast, on the shores of Belfast Loch. We've people here who've decided to vote yes tomorrow, others who've decided to vote no, and some who are still undecided. Wendy. Diana, we're here in, uh, in Newry, in the newest hotel right in the centre of this market town, just a few miles from the border. It's in the Kingdom of Morn, of course, about 90,000 people in the electorate. The local council is nationalist controlled. This area could be expected to return a yes vote, but there are still questions, uh, dissenting voices and, of course, questions for the party leaders. David. So nationalists in Newry and unionists in Carrickfergus and we'll be hearing from both communities as we go through the programme. Now, each of our five politicians has been campaigning hard these past few weeks, urging Northern Ireland to see the future their way. Lance Price reports. It's been a hard day and night, and I've been working like a dog. Seventeen and a half hours after the midnight deadline, and the deal was done. They defeated the sceptics who'd said the two governments would never keep all the parties at the table, let alone hammer out an agreement. In doing what we have done today, we have carried out what I believe to be the will of the overwhelming majority of people here in Northern Ireland. At first, it seemed that a comfortable majority for the agreement was all but assured, especially when the largest unionist party followed David Trimble's lead and voted three to one in favour. It was already clear that a similar majority would be needed in the referendum to show that both communities had accepted the deal. What I've said is below 60 bad, above 70 good. On current trends of voting intention, uh, once it's over 65%, then you've got a majority of unionists. You say yes, I say the yes campaign may have had the lion's share of the big names behind it, but it was the no's that hit the ground running. The Orange Order, Northern Ireland's biggest Protestant organisation, came out against the deal and Ian Paisley was out, pounding the pavements. When the yes voters come round, sweep, like them, sweep, away. <laughs> sweep them away. The yes campaign suddenly had a real battle on its hands. <laughs> By now everyone in the province had seen the agreement and many had read it too. The largest nationalist party, the SDLP, was rock solid behind a settlement that its leader, John Hume, had worked for years to secure. And despite the misgivings of some, Sinn Féin too threw its weight behind the deal. Today we cleared the way for the future. Tomorrow we start to build the future. But if Gerry Adams was so keen, thought many unionists, perhaps it's not such a good deal for us. And then these scenes did more perhaps than any other to undermine the Yes campaign. Adulation for the Balkan Street gang convicted of murder in the IRA's name. Ian Paisley and the No campaign were gathering strength. A majority of David Trimble's MPs deserted him. By now, nine of the 13 unionists elected to Westminster were against the deal, including Robert McCarthy, one of the province's most formidable lawyers. On the other side, the Yes campaigners hoped U2's Bono might persuade some of the voters 
Messrs Hume and Trimble had failed to reach. Ulster's electorate has taken more persuading than either man anticipated. So now, joining me, the first of our five guests tonight, David Trimble, the leader of the Ulster Unionists, who's, of course, urging a yes vote on his community in Northern Ireland. Mr Trimble, is it a millstone round your neck as you try and persuade Unionists to support this agreement that the overwhelming majority of Sinn Féin, 95%, have come out in favour of it and that people therefore smell a rat? Well, some people do, but more people think the matter through. 95% uh, of Sinn Féin, again, that, that's a slightly artificial, in fact, an entirely artificial position. Uh, Sinn Féin would dearly love to see this venture fail and fail with unionists responsible for it. And I think most unionists realise, particularly those scenes in Dublin... You think they're going ago, in in bad faith, then, do you? Oh, I'm, I'm, Sinn Féin? I'm, yes, I'm sure they want to see it fail, and I'm sure they want to be able to blame unionists. And I think most unionists realise that the scenes we saw there uh, were done to manipulate unionist opinion, and most unions are determined not to let Sinn Féin off the hook. They're on the hook of consent, they're on the hook of having to go into a partitionist body, they're on the hook of having to satisfy the stringent tests that have been set out to show that they're committed to peaceful means, which will include their actions, including the old familiar friend of decommissioning. But you, and they're on that hook, and we mustn't let them off but, it. But you say they want to see it fail. Um, it, can it work without them? Oh, yes. Because I'm quite sure that we'll see returned to the Assembly uh, that the majority of nationalist representatives will be for the more moderate centrist SDLP role than Sinn Féin. You know that the big worry is that there are going to be people in the government of this province who haven't given up the gun. Uh, what guarantee are you giving to your supporters that you and the Prime Minister are able to ensure that Sinn Féin people will not be there until there has been an absolute abandonment of the armed struggle and of the weapons that make it possible. The agreement is quite clear. People are not entitled to be included in the administration unless they're committed to peaceful means. Now, there are concerns about whether the me mechanisms are going to be effective, and that's the issue the Prime Minister has addressed. And I say to unionists that this is a safe bet. Either it works in accordance with the agreement and people behave as we wish, or if they don't, or if the Prime Minister lets us down, which I doubt, but just in case he does, then we're able to say this is not the agreement we signed up to and we can walk away. So unionists lose nothing by proceeding on this basis, but they will lose, and Northern Ireland will lose, if we turn the matter down, if we vote no, and let Sinn Féin off the hook and let them then misrepresent this problem as being a problem of intransigent unionism, which is not the case. Well, we know that the Prime Minister has upped the ante from what the agreement says on this by saying those who threaten violence will be excluded from the government of, of no, Northern Ireland. No, he hasn't Ireland. upped the ante. He's, he, he is summarising what is in the agreement. All right. But how, how can you possibly say of any one person that they have given up, abandoned violence, and no longer supported by or supporting organisations that, uh, that have violence or that have weapons? Is Thurs it possible? Thurs Thursday a week ago, in his Balmoral speech, the Prime Minister set out a number of tests that are fairly precise, and he further said that those tests will be embodied in legislation in plain and direct terms. That's his phrase. So we will see them moving into the legislation. They will be given the force of law. And that then gives you something that will be clearly enforceable. And, of course, in enforcing that, uh, as the Prime Minister has said, we will regard Sinn Féin as being inextricably linked to the IRA and so on for other bodies as well. And it's very easy to envisage the legal mechanisms to achieve right. that. Tell me one last thing before we go to Carrick Fergus, who's been listening with interest to this. Do you expect to be sitting down in the government of Northern Ireland with members of Sinn Féin? No, I don't. And I, but I do expect what, to ever? see... Whatever? Never? Let us look into the foreseeable future. And for the foreseeable future, I do not see that at all. But what I do see is the foreseeable future is the opportunity for us to bring back into our hands in Northern Ireland control over local matters which should have been in our hands over the last 25 years and to do it moreover on a more broadly basis, on a broader basis than ever before and consequently on a more stable basis and to have here in Northern Ireland the opportunity of creating in the future a society at ease with itself and at ease with its neighbours right. and that is the prize to be obtained Well, let's, let's hear what reaction there is from Carrick Fergus and then we'll come back to you to comment on what you hear. Diana? Some people here feel that David Trimble has let them down and, in fact, failed them, particularly on the issue of decommissioning. David Simpson. Yes, Mr Trimble promised the electorate that he wouldn't sit down and negotiate anything with anybody that represented terrorists, especially when they held on to their arsenal. He did that, and therefore we can't take his word for over this agreement. 
He gave away the Government of Ireland Act 1920 to be replaced, not to re be replaced again, but Articles 2 and 3 is gone on the statute books in the South, only amended, but it can be returned again if the so-called Assembly doesn't work. And your concern still about decommissioning? You feel that David Trimble's let you down in this? Well, I feel it's been a difficult decision for him to make. He's, only, he's had to go a way forward to make it work, but I feel it's been a big concern and one of the reasons why that you are undecided on the vote. I think that in itself has let us down. Let's turn here to Barbara Smith. Do you feel the ordinary unionist has, in fact, been very much let down by David Trimble and the agreement? Yes, I'm a member of uh, David Trimble's party, and I will be voting no tomorrow because I think that 95% of Sinn Féin are quite right when they say that the union is weakened. We have de facto unity given through the North-South bodies who will have executive powers and in fact the politics of coercion will remain in Northern Ireland as the IRA have indicated that they will hold on to their weaponry and we will still have the gun and the ballot box remaining within Northern Ireland politics. So Did I'd you feel that David Trimble had any alternative? I think that David Trimble should have pulled back from this agreement and I think that he should even at this late, late stage provide a lead for unionists and pull away from the position that he is now in because this is fatal, fatal for our community. Now Stephen McAllister, you are in the RUC and you were wounded in an IRA attack. One of the things that happens in this particular agreement is that prisoners get early release, something that's major concern to you. Yes, uh, I feel second uh, that uh, people that have committed some of the most heinous crimes since Nazi Germany was defeated will be returned to our society early. Uh, they will not have to serve their full time in prison. I have been an Ulster Unionist voter most of my working life, and I believe that it's time to put country before party. Stephen McAllister, thank you. David. Well, there are some critical voices of uh, unionism, Mr Trimble. Um, what about this point about decommissioning, that it's not realistic, that you said you'd never negotiate with terrorists, you have, and they don't believe that decommissioning will work? Well, I haven't actually negotiated with terrorists. I've negotiated with the British government, the Irish government, the SDLP. That's, those are the only parties I've negotiated with. Now, we had a problem last September when the government changed its position. And we had to consider how to respond to that. And we could have done what other parties did and run away from the situation and left the union undefended and the unionist case unrepresented. And we decided to take the hard decision to stay in there and to present the unionist case. And we did so successfully. Look at what Sinn Féin was saying a month or two before the end of the talks. They said the union was going to be changed. It has not. The union hasn't been affected in any way whatsoever. They said that there was going to be no assembly. There is an assembly. We're in there. They said that there was going to be strong cross-border bodies with not subject to a unionist veto. They were defeated on that. We have got those uh, cross-border bodies entirely subject to the assembly. So, I mean, we did achieve something for unionism there in terms of driving down the Sinn Féin agenda and producing arrangements, such as the British Irish Council covering the whole of the British Isles, which provides for cooperation on a British Isles basis, something that unionists have wanted, the context we've wanted for some time. Now, those are solid, positive achievements, and they wouldn't have been obtained by running away. All right, let's come back to this point there of decommissioning. Um, you had a letter from the Prime Minister, which you asked for him to write, uh, and he said in that, explaining decommissioning, that uh, he confirmed that in his view the effect of decommissioning will come into effect in June. That is, the process should begin straight away. Now, how can you say to people who vote tomorrow that you know how that process will come about, who will police it, who will know whether it's effective? Well, it's all, I mean, what, it's is it, what is it that you're actually saying to people, and the Prime Minister is saying to people, will happen? It's what the Prime Minister is saying. And the pr arrangements are there. There is a commission. There are decommissioning schemes. They're all ready. One of the three paramilitary parties have, has already taken the first step by nominating a representative. So the requirement to start work on this, which becomes operative, the Prime Minister says, in June, is to immediately nominate other parties. And then there will be, under the decommissioning schemes, obligations which follow after that. Now, the effect of all this is, David, that we will be able to tell well before any transfer of functions to the Northern New Assembly, whether or not the parties linked to paramilitaries are discharging their obligations on this, and then the other provisions in the agreement will come into effect. But it's up to government, it's not up to me. Decommissioning was never up to me. Decommissioning was up to government, and it's up to government to carry it yeah, through. Yeah, but do you believe but, it will happen? But 
Do you believe? Do you actually oh, yes, believe I think it will? It will. Well, I people think will come and give their arms up I think and we disband will their organisations. Well, they have to. They will have to, or else. And it's up to government to deliver this. But what I have to say to those who doubt government is that voting no won't achieve it. No, but voting no will mean nothing will happen. The only way you will see pressure put on the paramilitaries is by voting yes and then keeping pressure on the government. Because what's at stake here is not my word, it's Tony Blair's word. OK. Let's go and hear more opinion, this time from Newry, uh, where Wendy Austin is. Thanks, David. Well, here in Newry, there have been quite a few uh, question marks and eyebrows raised listening to David Trimble. Tommy Carroll, uh, uh, he's been fairly critical, to put it mildly, of your party, Sinn Féin. Do, do you think that he will ever engage with your, your party leader? Well, uh, David Trimble, and his also Unionist Party, has refused to talk to Sinn Féin all the way through the, the peace process, and he refused to talk to them during the talks itself. And it sounds like he's going to go into the Assembly and still refuse to talk to Sinn Féin and recognise it as a party. And I'd like to ask him, at what point is he going to speak to Sinn Féin and engage like a normal political party would? Will your vote depend on that, or will you be voting with your party line? I'll be going along with the party line. You'll be voting yes tomorrow? I'm going along with the party line, and it is called for a yes vote. Well, Sean O'Keen, uh, I know that you've uh, reservations about all of this. Uh, have any of them uh, been allayed by what you've heard David Trimble said, or has it uh, make, you, make you ask you even more questions? Uh, it hasn't made me make, ask any more questions. Uh, well, one question I would like to ask David is, when the IRA don't decommission, I, did, I don't think they will, I don't think many people do think they will, and Sinn Féin are in the Assembly as the agreement allows them to be. He says he will walk away. I'd like to know where he is going to go, what's going to happen uh, with regard to the official Unionist Party when de decommissioning doesn't happen. And on, well, on that point of decommissioning, I know Terry Gallagher has concerns about that too. Do you uh, take on board what David Trimble has just had to say about it? Well, what, what else is coming across to me about what Mr Trimble is saying is that he seems to be focusing solely on the decommissioning issue. And I think it's a side issue rather than rather than the main point that he keeps bringing up and um, i also can sense from mr trimble is um division already even before the results of the, the votes come through in that he is concentrating solely on Sinn fein and the problems that he has with them a lot of points being raised here in Newry. david back to you and uh, let's now go to carrick fergus Fiona McKinley, do you think that David Trimble is brave or foolhardy? I think he's been absolutely brave. I mean, he could have run away from the talks like the UK unionists and like the DUP. And instead, he stayed in there, got an agreement which is based on consent, which changes Articles 2 and 3, which brings devolved government back to, Nor back to Northern Ireland, just in line with the rest of the United Kingdom, with Scotland and Wales getting devolution. And um, he's got rid of the Anglo-Irish Agreement as well. Uh, it's a good deal for unionists. Stuart McLenaghan, do you think he's abandoned traditional unionist voters? No, I disagree with that. I completely agree with Fiona. I think David Tremble has achieved an awful lot inside of what he's been doing. Yet he, he split uh, the unionist party. No, he, his party's still behind him. He's made the DUP and he's split away, but I don't think they're relevant at the minute anyway. Not even the other MPs? <laughs> the other, well, I don't know, but I think that what he's done is right. If he hadn't been in those talks, he wouldn't have got the same agreement. Well, let's ask Trevor Gribben whether he is impressed with David Trimble. All of my adult life, this land has known conflict, and, and that conflict's meant terrible suffering for many people. It's left us with a raw sectarianism that's eaten away at the core of our society. What David Trimble and other leaders have done is given us an opportunity for a new beginning, a new beginning that hopefully will, will lead from intransigence to, to accommodation, from uh, fear to hope. It's, it's an opportunity for a new beginning. It's up to the people to seize that, and I will be by, by voting yes tomorrow. Trevor Griffin, thank you. David again. I'm joined now by Gerry Adams, the leader of Sinn Féin, of course, also arguing for a yes vote in the referendum tomorrow. Uh, Mr Adams, you'll have heard what David Trimble said. He doesn't expect Sinn Féin to be in the government of Northern Ireland, but he expects you to start decommissioning in June. Is that the correct position? Is that what you're going to do? Well, the agreement which Mr... Trimble signed up to on Good Friday can't be cherry picked. We are going into the election. We have a mandate. We're Irish Republicans. Mr. Trimble's a unionist. He goes with his mandate. I'll go with my mandate. If we have enough votes to go into the cabinet, we will be in the cabinet. So are you saying that you'll satisfy the unionists that you have, that the IRA, Sinn Féin and the IRA have decommissioned, that the weapons have been given up, that the arms struggle is over before you go into that 
cabinet or into I'm that government. I'm saying that I'm going to the ballot box and I'm going to ask citizens, will they vote for our party? Now, I want to see all the guns taken out of Irish politics, not just the Republican ones, not just the Loyalist ones, but the British ones, the licensed weapons. I want to see a total disarmament of the situation. I want to see a total demilitarization of the situation. I want to see it permanent. And I also want to see people getting some sense of moving into the future. But the, people from I... Fergus, the people mm. from Carrick Fergus and the people from Newry, are you saying living, the... living together, David, on this island as equals. Are you saying the war is over? Well, who, who can say the war is over? Well, you on... could for a start. Well, first of all, let, let's get this very clear, David. Your government has the biggest army in my country. Your government is the cause of the conflict in this country. And what we need to do is to bring about a peace. Yeah, you're not no, now sorry, speaking David. to the agreement, are you? I am It doesn't mention the, the British Army in the agreement. It mentions, it mentions paramilitary weapons the British, and decommissioning. Well, it doesn't say the British Army has to do anything in this agreement well, for you well, to sit in well, the assembly. Well, first of all, it does give big commitments about demilitarization of the situation. It does give big commitments about bringing about a peace settlement. Now, when we get a peace settlement, and this isn't a peace settlement, it's a, the process towards a peace settlement, then the war will be over. Do you think that one of the troubles with getting this through the unionist community is that people look at what you've achieved and believe that you have done it because of the power of the gun, that you've got where you have because of the gun? Well, I, I think some people may think that. And I'm trying to be very mindful because I want to make peace with the unions. The unionist and I need to be able to live together as brothers and sisters, neighbours on this island, working out a future between ourselves to suit ourselves. So I understand the difficulties which Mr. Trimble, Mr. Trimble has yet to speak to me, but I still understand the difficulties he has. And the big difficulty is that what is required here is change, and unionism is against change. Unionism finds it easier to say no than it does to say yes. Well, we have uh, unionists listening. We also have um, nationalists listening in Newry. Let's go to Newry first. Well, here in Newry, Tony McPhillips, you're now an independent Republican councillor because uh, you decided that you couldn't go along with the direction in which Sinn Féin was going. What have you to say to, to Gerry Adams now? Well, firstly, I, I would certainly say to Gerry that his, his speech at the Ardèche two weeks ago in which he said, well done, David, uh, rang of more truth than people really thought. Because this agreement has clearly, no matter where, what part you're reading it, has legitimised the British presence here in Ireland. And I don't know how he can... He can Compare that then with the state of position that he's after given there, which is that he believes the British are the cause of the conflict. So I can't understand how he can, on the one hand, sign up to an agreement that legitimises the presence and then says that they are the cause of the conflict. And I would ask uh, Jerry in particular, if he's taken part in this so-called cabinet, is he going to have collective responsibility? And is he prepared to take part in a cabinet that will continue to imprison Republican prisoners? That's, uh, doubtless those are some of your concerns too, Tommy McCarry, you're a kind of disaffected former Sinn Féin as well. That's right, Wendy. It strikes me that uh, perhaps Jerry might be relieved in view of what happened after the Ardèche that I'm not actually climbing on his platform at the moment. Uh, I believe that, incidentally, that this agreement is a partitionist agreement and that it's bringing us back towards a Stormont setup. The uh, thing that strikes me is that in view of the huge effort that's being made at the moment to shore up the Trimble position, and shored up by powerful forces, the British government and the Irish government, that whatever chance there was of a peace process, which inevitably, if it was to succeed, would have had to deliver meaningful reforms, such as the disbandment of the RUC and other positive, definite reforms, meaningful cross-border bodies, that that will not now be delivered. One thing that strikes me is there will shortly be coming a litmus test for this agreement, and I see it particularly along the Garfachy Road. Can Jerry assure me that he and his party will take every effort, make every effort to prevent Mr. Trimble and his Orange Lodges being bulldozed down their Garfachy Road this year again? I quite took many questions there for David Trimble. David? Okay, for what Jerry for Adams, Adams as it happens, yeah. but well, anyway, I, um, Jerry Adams, what do you say to what you've heard? Well, I mean, I don't want, even want to get into any of that. They, they have a position, it's a valid enough position. Uh, what we're about is the future, we're about change. I'm opposed to the Orange March that's going down Garbahi Road. I've done much more about that than Tommy ever will do. And that's all accepted each other's uh, points on these issues is valid. And let's try and move the entire situation forward. It's as simple as that. Let's keep moving forward. The struggle isn't over. Both the last two speakers uh, know that. And the struggle has to continue 
until the people of this island have independence and unity together. Even though you have allowed the people of the North, conceded, if you like, politically, that the people of the North can decide whether there's United Ireland or not, and even though you've gone into an assembly which is under the British Crown? Well, first of all, the business about going into the assembly shows how much Sinn Féin have stretched ourselves in terms of trying to reach out towards unionism because we were opposed to the assembly, but we recognise it as the only route into the All-Ireland uh, bodies. And in all of our sense of this, I remain as anti-partitionist um, now and on Good Friday as I did for the last 30 or 40 years, and I remain as committed. You see, in the mark of anyone who wants to try and, and, and make uh, some sort of in intervention in this from a Republican position is to continue the struggle, because I'm going to continue the struggle until we have peace and justice and freedom on this island. Okay, let's hear from Carrick Fergus what they make of what you said. Diana? Yes, indeed, a lot of hackles rising here in Carrick Fergus, listening to Gerry Adams. Uh, Jennifer Campbell, first of all, if I could ask you if Gerry Adams said anything this evening that could sway your vote either way. No, Gerry Adams could not sway my vote at all. He would have no influence on my decision to vote yes tomorrow, which I will be doing. The only reason I'd be doing that is I feel it's the only opportunity we have to go forward for our children, for a new chance, for a new life. But certainly my concerns have been trusting and believing what Gerry Adams says. Drew Hamill, do you think that Sinn Féin comes out of this deal best? I must disagree with what Mr Trimble said earlier. I believe Sinn Féin has come out of this cock a hoop. I also must say to Mr Adams that uh, people of both religions have lived peaceably in Carrick, Fergus and East Antrim right through the Troubles. I believe uh, Mr Adams is still the representative of IRA Sinn Féin. He's the big winner in this agreement. The double approach of violence and politics has brought Jerry Adams to the negotiating table and indeed his organisation has said that this indeed is a further step to United Ireland. Would you give the referendum a yes or a no vote? I would give the referendum a no vote. Let's hear from Trevor Griffin. Do you think Jerry Adams could say anything this evening that would help bring more unionist people on board? I think the Republican movement has moved. They've recognised the legitimacy of, of Northern Ireland. I think they've a long way to move. Jerry Adams coined the phrase confidence building measure. It's about time he began to have some confidence building measures. The Republican movement, IRA and Sinn Féin, have to apologise for what they've done. Do you uh, need Jerry Adams community. publicly tonight to apologise for the atrocities that the IRA has committed? I don't think Jerry Adams is going to publicly apologise tonight in this programme, but I think over the weeks and months to come, one of the things we've been looking for is that they publicly apologise, that they admit they were wrong, that, to use a biblical term, that they repent of that and turn from what's wrong and do that in invisible ways by decommissioning, by stopping punishment beatings and by seeking to reach out uh, to the people they've been seeking uh, to wrong over these last decades. Trevor Griffin, thank you very much. And David again. So not just an apology and repentance, but stopping punishment beatings and decommissioning arms over the coming weeks and months. Is, well, that, is that what Sinn Féin will do? Well, first of all, Sinn Féin will go, as I said before, to the ballot box. And Sinn Féin will put our analysis before the electorate. And if Sinn Féin gets a mandate, Sinn Féin expects those last speakers to respect that mandate in the same way as I have to respect the mandate which their representatives will have. Now, let me, let me break, take up a you point. You haven't quite answered no, the I'm point. No, I'm going to answer you the question. The David, point let me, I want to make a very, I want to make a very, in, I'm against punishment beatings. I don't want to waste time. I want to make a very important point here. I am sorry. I've said it many times before. And I regret the hurt which Republicans have inflicted. I have said it now. I've said it a number of times. If I keep repeating it, it becomes trite. I listened to a speaker earlier on from Uri, a man called Tommy Carroll. His two brothers were killed. They are the invisible victims of this conflict. The people who were killed by state terrorism, by the RUC, by the British Army, the, the children who were victims of plastic bullet murders, the people who have been locked up in imprisonment, the, the internees, the people whose houses have been raided scores and scores of times, the people whose areas are saturated by British troops now. And yet, you, get, and, yet you brought, and yet you brought to the Sinn Féin conference the very visible sight of the Balkan Street killers who have been in jail, who were brought out, and you welcomed them. Yes. And as you know, that upset the unionist community more well, than probably well, anything else during the campaign. First of all, campaign. I have already said that, that I can understand how some people were offended. Was it a mistake? I, sorry, no, it was not a mistake. I'm delighted that they were there. They had the right to be there. But let me also say this. Some people wanted to be offended. Now, let me go back to the serious point I made earlier on. What do you mean some people wanted to be offended? If the unionists, you see, the, the Dr. Paisleys and the other no-men of unionism 
all the time need to blame someone else. And it's about time unionism had the confidence to stand up for itself. You know, unionists still won't talk to Republicans. What are they afraid of? I mean, are, are they afraid of peace? James Molyneux said the most destabilizing thing that ever happened in the history of this statelet was the IRA cessation. What are they afraid of? This isn't about me. This isn't about the adults in Carrick Fergus or in Newry. This is about our kids. This is about our children. This is about the next generation and the generation after, after that being able on this island. Five million people on the island of Ireland and we can't work out some arrangement, some, some accommodation, some dispensation to live together. And I do think it's very important, and I think with respect on, on a programme like this, that someone has to take responsibility for the killings done by the Brand Nelsons of this world, the killings done by the British Crown Forces and the people out there who, whose suffering has not been recognised because I'm prepared to recognise the hurt which Republicans have inflicted. The British government needs to face up to its responsibilities. Mr Blair, I think, is trying his best, but we should not, under any circumstances, give concessions to the new men of unionism. Right. Thank you very much. Let's hear now from Newry, lastly, on what Mr Adams has said. Well, Kevin Byrne is a Sinn Féin supporter here, and you are in favour, obviously, of what your party leader is saying. You go along with all of it. Yes, I go along with all of it, but I would also like to ask him. Um, Tony Blair has been over twice to talk uh, for David Trimble. Could he quantify what damage uh, the appeasement he, he's made to unionism has done to the S campaign? You feel that he's been appeasing unionists up yeah. to now. I know that uh, we're looking for points here, but there are questions as well. We have a first-time voter here doing a political science uh, exam tomorrow, in fact. What, what, what would you like to say to Gerry Adams? I would like to know, uh, it's obvious to me that at this point in time in the peace process, the IRA is still seen to be needed by Republicans, is still a military organisation. I would like to know, in political or constitutional terms, in, in relation to Northern Ireland and the Republic, uh, at what point would the IRA be seen not to be needed to be redundant in the Republican eyes? Gerardine Donahue, you've been listening to all of this. Uh, you're a, a yes voter. Um, what's your view? Well, I, I think it's quite remarkable that we have uh, from Carrick Fergus the no voters actually having similarities with the Republican no vote here. And it seems to me that David Trimble was right. Too many people in Northern Ireland are living in the past. And I think the one clear message that must go out tomorrow is that a vote, a yes vote, is clearly a vote. One thing guaranteed that there will be decommissioning in two years' time. A no vote, we will be back to the status quo. We have no chance of decommissioning. And I think on that score alone, we have to vote for the future and vote tomorrow a positive yes, because at least decommissioning is on the rails to uh, start. Thank you. David. Well, I'm joined now by Dr Ian Paisley of the Democratic Unionists. Um, he is, of course, urging a no vote. Is a I'm yes I'm vote or a no vote more likely to secure peace? Well, I, I don't think a yes vote could secure peace because a yes vote secures putting the best marksmen, the best bombers, and the best brains in the business of destroying people back in the streets in 24 months, and in the meantime demoralized the Royal Ulster Constabulary and started to disarm them. And if you put uh, that sort of terrorist on the street, you have him ready and willing to reach out to the arsenal that he knows is there, the biggest arsenal of terrorist weapons in the whole Western world available, and you're prepared to do that, then you're leaving the people of Ulster a prey. So Jerry, Jerry Adams and, and Sinn Féin, and indeed aided and abetted by David Trimble, are simply conspiring, waiting for a renewal of the war? Yes, I, I have read their literature, and they say that this is not the finish. And, uh, and one of their uh, negotiators said at the talks that if they didn't get what they wanted, they would go back to that which they were best, uh, known best in doing. But wouldn't you rather have them inside an assembly, held down by decommissioning, not allowed to be there if they're supporting violence, taking part in the democratic process rather than on the outside? But you see, when you say that, you're in ignorance of what the IRA is. The IRA has made it clear and have its constitution before me. And it says the army authority shall retain, maintain and ensure the safety of all armaments, equipment and other resources of the IRA until such times as the sovereignty and unity of the Republic of Ireland has been attained. Once a settlement has been agreed, leading to a united Ireland, all decisions relating to decommissioning of armaments, equipment and other resources must be ratified by an army convention. So they can't decommission. 
That's their constitution. And the IRA's not going back now. And they've been honest. They've yeah. been honest. They've said we're not decommissioning one gun. Isn't your real fear that if there is a vote, yes, and if the assembly goes ahead, Protestants are going to have to share power or will effectively share power with Roman Catholics? And that's what you're really against. The IRA will be in a process which you don't think they should be in because you think, as you said 20 years ago, and I don't know whether you've changed your mind, that their real aim is to annihilate Protestantism. Well, that is right. That's what happened in the south of Ireland. The south of Ireland, when they drew the line, there was 10% of the entire population Protestant. Today there's 2.5%, so they eliminated 75%. Anybody knows what this struggle has been about on the border. It has been genocide. Farm after farm, emptied by the IRA, killing people, killing people that were the mainstay of the community. It's okay. not a matter either of Protestants and Roman Catholics in, in government. That's nothing to do with it. It is terrorists, terrorists in government. And whether those terrorists be professing Roman Catholics or professing Protestants, they ought not to be in the government. That's what I am totally right. opposed to. And let we'll me come, say, come back to you. I, have, I, I presented myself uh, to, and perhaps the people of, uh, of England don't know this, I present myself every European election to the whole of the Northern Ireland electorate. I'm returned at the top of the poll. I don't hide my views. My views are plain. They're well known. People can dump me if they like, but at least I, I've never been I, I think that. I, I think they're well aware of that. That's right. I've heard you say it many times. That's Let's right. hear the reaction to what you said from, first of all, the people of... Newry and join Wendy Austin. Wendy? Ruth Sutherland's been listening to what Ian Paisley has to say. Ruth has chosen to come and live here. She has three children, works in health care. Uh, what do you want to say to Dr Paisley? Well, I know Dr Paisley to be a good European uh, MEP and my involvement here in Newry has been with the District Partnerships for Peace and Reconciliation. I want to know what Dr Paisley is going to, re to do to reduce sectarianism because we're all put into these boxes which is not helpful, it's not going to help us resolve and his language is inflammatory and it frightens me and I want him to help us to make peace. What, what about the, the no campaign uh, and its vision of the future? Well, it, it doesn't offer me a future. I moved here, I, and as you say, I have three children. I want a future for those children. The no campaign definitely offers, offers no hope and no future. The yes campaign is offering us a chance to start. And if the politicians would look to local people, we have been working at a local level, DUP, Sinn Féin, um, the nationalists of all shades. We've been sitting around the table for more than two years in this peace process. We're trying. It's your responsibility to try at your level. What do you say to the voice that says that you're inflammatory in the way that you speak and you're not doing anything to reduce sectarianism? Well, I think there's a contradiction. First of all, I'm a good European MP. Uh, I have been responsible for getting the money for peace and reconciliation to Northern Ireland along with John Hume and along with Jim Nicholson. I worked unceasingly for that. Uh, and uh, then I'm told the other hand that my speeches are inflammatory. Now, I am a Protestant. I have no apology to make for my Protestantism. I have no apology to make uh, 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 for that. Uh, people who are Roman Catholics and hold to the Roman Catholic faith sincerely and truly, I, don't, I say they're a right to tell us what they believe and to preach it and proclaim it. But that is not the issue. The issue is a document which says to me, look, your constitution, which was the, is the 1920 uh, Act, we're going to repeat it. And if Ireland, Northern Ireland, tomorrow says yes to this agreement, Northern Ireland, are you are, what are you going to do? You're going to be well, a, a, a dinosaur left behind by history? No, I, I'm, afraid, uh, I'm afraid you've got it all wrong. I'm afraid the majority of unionist people, and I know Northern Ireland very well, and I have campaigned it many, many times, and the majority of unions have already said no. Think about it. But you're it. not a Democrat Think. then, because you're talking about a majority of unionists rather than a majority of Northern Ireland. Well, a I, democratic view surely would you be. If you, say, if you say you make no distinction between Catholic and Protestant, then surely your view would be if a majority say yes in Northern Ireland, the majority David, you don't, I'm afraid you don't know the agreement. The agreement is there has to be a majority of Roman Catholic people or Republican or Nicene, and a majority of unions. Not on the I referendum, in the assembly, I, once the assembly is... No, this was all, this, this was all through, it was never mentioned before. The re referendum doesn't but, have to oh have yes. a majority on both When sides. I was in the talks, it was said clearly that when it went to referendum, that both parties must 
have a majority to carry it. Now they're changing it because they, they're not going to get the majority. And I think it would only be fair to say why on one side you must have a majority of the minority and then say on the other side you don't need a majority of right. the majority. Let's hear from Diana Medill and Carrick Fergus. Diana. Diane Compton, do you identify with anything that Sane Paisley's been saying? No, I find it very hard to identify with Mr. Paisley. He's a man brimful and overflowing with negativity as far as I'm concerned. And I don't think any people in the young generation can identify with him. His methods are old and outdated. The Yes campaign have tried to reach out to us. I also take but exception. But do you not feel they were bribing you with pop no, concerts? No, this is what I take exception to. I take exception to people, especially in the new posse, who, who claim we're being bribed, who claim we're being duped, who claim we can't think for ourselves and can't read the document for ourselves because he's given us no credit as young people for having the politically, political astuteness to vote for ourselves. What do you think, Barbara Smith, of what Ian Paisley's been saying this evening? Well, I agree with Dr Paisley and what he has been saying in that this agreement cannot deliver peace to the people. We are being sold a lie here. Fundamentally, there has not been a meeting of minds between the people. On the one hand, we have Trimble saying that the union is strengthened. On the other hand, we have Gerry Adams, who is seeing it as a move towards Irish unity. They both can't be right. So secondly, I want to deal with as well the uh, immorality of this agreement. Dr Paisley is quite right that it is immoral for terrorists to be allowed to hold on to their weaponry for the politics of coercion to continue. But I also want okay. to emphasise constitutional change, which I think that we have to pick up on. We've got to move Barbara to the next person, who is Fiona McKinley. Fiona, what did you think about what Ian Paisley was saying? Do you identify with it at I don't, all? I don't identify with Ian Paisley at all. And I want to ask him, um, you know, he has obvious concerns about the inclusion of terrorists in the negotiating process. Well, how exactly did he feel when William McRae shared a platform with Billy Wright? And on another point, Fiona McKinley as well, do you think he would have strengthened the unionist cause by being at the talks process? Had he stayed in and argued the case, perhaps the agreement wouldn't be so distasteful to him now. Thank you very much indeed. I'd David like again. A, a last point. Did you make a mistake by not taking part in the negotiations and yet condemning this thing without even reading it when mm. it was published? Well, that's not true. I read it. And I have read it over and over again. And I, I am glad the people of Northern Ireland had read it because the trouble was in Europe, in the parliamentary debate there, they got up and the people who commended it had never read it. I challenged them and they couldn't tell me they'd read it at all. Let me say I read, the, read it, I knew what was coming, I was following it. I had uh, Mr. I, I got uh, the, Mr. Mitchell's uh, foreword, you know, he, he issued a thing on the Tuesday I got it. <laughs> I knew what was happening. All right. and, and one last thing. Are you saying, which I think you were earlier, that there's sufficient weight in unionism to stop this assembly ever really being effective? Is that the nub of what you're saying? Well, it's a strange thing that now? Mr. Trimble cannot persuade the majority of MPs in his own party. Well, that's not so strange. Tonight. But whether he can... But whether he can tonight, I sat in the House of Orange at a meeting presided over by the Grand Master of Ireland in which we had eight unionist MPs all saying this, and I read what they said, they said, we solemnly pledge ourselves and urge our fellow citizens to ensure by every lawful means the rejection of an agreement designed to destroy the union. Okay. And that's our case. Dr. Paisley, thank you very much. Thank Let's you. just hear a last word from Nuri on what Dr. Paisley said. It's just a point from Brian Rountree, who's a, a local businessman here. I think Dr. Paisley's living in absolute fear. I think fear of equal partnership. And last but most eff effectively, I think it's fear of ultimate domination. I think he's afraid of losing that domination. And I think that tomorrow's vote is going to tell a tale for Dr. Paisley. I'm joined now by John Hume, the leader of the SDLP, one of the key figures in these negotiations that led to the agreement. Uh, Mr. Hume, you'll have heard what was said earlier, and in particular David Trimble saying he didn't expect Sinn Féin to get into government in Northern Ireland because he didn't expect them to give up their arms. What can you say to reassure people, and what will you do to try and ensure that there is decommissioning of arms, that people aren't being sold a pup here, where people <coughs> get into the assembly, get into politics, but still have the armor light buried in the ditch? Well, the, the main point about, first of all, uh, the, the agreement commits all parties to disarmament, and of course, uh, the, there has been uh, and it needs to be said, there has been a cessation of violence by the paramilitary organizations and there's peace in our streets. And uh, when the elections take place to the assembly, 
uh, parties will be elected by the people to go to that assembly and they will have to be totally and absolutely committed to peaceful and democratic methods. If they're not, then they can be expelled from it. And, from you, and, the would, government you, situation. and would you play your part in expelling I, Sinn Féin if you thought that they were still using force, prepared to use force, well, well, first keeping of all, arms? First of all, let me make clear that I engaged in dialogue with Jerry Adams and the purpose of that dialogue, as we said at the time, was an end to violence, followed by all party talks whose objective would be agreement that had to have the allegiance of both sections of our people. And that has been happening. And I believe that the violence has stopped. And the real question about decommissioning is when those organizations that were using violence say they have stopped, are they really telling the truth? Mm. Because as I've said before, if they were playing games, they can decommission on Monday and recommission secretly well, what do you on understand? Tuesday. What do you understand? My understanding is that the violence has ended and in accordance with the agreement, the disarmament will take place to the satisfaction of an independent commission. And that's how it should be, and that's what's agreed in the agreement. And let's also remember this. But this is an issue that's been exaggerated out of all proportions. Nobody wants to see an end of violence, more than myself and my party. We've been in the front line against it for 30 years, and we've done all in our power to stop it. But where in the world, when conflict ended, do you see surrender? It's not quite psychological. For example, you take this country, Ireland, north and south. Most of the major parties, except my own, were founded out of the gun. Where are their guns? Where are Fianna Fáil's guns? Where are Fianna Gael's guns? Where are the Unionist Party's guns? Where are the Democratic okay. Left guns? Okay, I get the this point. This is the point I'm making. Yes, the real the question is, have they stopped using them? Nevertheless, in this agreement, yes. the responsibility for kicking people out, effectively, yes, if yes. they return to violence, yeah. is, has to be exercised by both sides, both Protestant or both Unionist and Nationalist. You Will, can are take you, it uh, no, let, Sorry, yes. are you, um, well, perhaps yes, you're about yes. to say what I, I asked you to say. to say. Are you going to say that the SDLP can be relied on to act against Sinn Féin if it finds they're reverting to violence in the way that you have to if they're you to be kicked out of the Assembly? You can take it for granted that the SDLP will continue its policy throughout its existence as a political party of total and absolute opposition to violence because it only makes our problem worse in addition to taking human life. And if there is any party in the government that would emerge from this agreement who is engaged in violence, we would automatically seek them to be removed immediately. Okay. Carrick Fergus, uh, let's go to there and uh, join Diana Medill. What do they make of what uh, John Hume has said? Well, the first point is from Leonard Sluman. I would like to uh, say to Mr. Hume, does he think that uh, sharing power with Jerry Adams will be accepted? <coughs> pardon me, acceptable to the Unionist majority. Mr. Hume, I believe uh, you have, uh, you and Jerry and Tony and Bill Clinton have succeeded in hoodwinking a small section of the Unionist politicians into signing this Chamberlain uh, peace agreement in our time agreement. This is also the part cry of the Unionist yes camp, which I believe will have the same result as the Chamberlain agreement. Well, uh, let's move to Mark Wilson and see if he agrees with you on this particular point. Do you see it as a big betrayal? No, I don't necessarily do. I think that uh, John Hume has uh, helped uh, win confidence over some of the unionists who were perhaps wavering on the line. You would trust him? I would trust him, certainly, yes. I think that he, he obviously appearing, doing the, the show piece, appearing on the stage with uh, David Trimble was part and parcel of, of the whole deal, but certainly I would trust John Hume. Now, what would your reservations be, James McCauley? Uh, my reservations would be that at the very outset of these talks, Mr. Hume said there was no place for guns or arms under the table. Now he says it's okay for them to be under the table, provided they're not used. If they're not going to be used, there's no need for them to be under the table. And I would like Mr. Hume to unequivocally say that the guns must be removed under the table and that he will oppose the participation of Sinn Féin in the governing of this province until those guns are removed from under the table. On that point, back mm -hmm. to David. Uh, well, well, I would like to answer that straight right. away. He obviously hasn't heard me. Uh, I, said, I said very clearly total and ap absolute opposition to the use of guns. Uh, and I also said that all the parties to the talks or to the, to the agreement, including my own, are totally committed to, the, to, to disarmament to be carried out 
to be carried out to the satisfaction of the fantasy. independent commission. You said it was and fantasy I, to expect people just to suddenly produce all their arms no, and no, put them on the table. No, to surrender to government exactly. uh, is what I was talking about. I think that's about. the point he was yeah. making. Under no, the table, was, meaning no, that no, they're under the table, no, no, they, he, they may no. be used or they may not be used. No, he was quoting an earlier quotation of mine right. saying that I Ta wouldn't be talking to a party with guns on the table, under the table or outside the door. To the and that point. is quite correct because anybody that wants to use guns to achieve political objectives is totally opposed by myself and my party. Turn to the other point. Uh, you're accused of hoodwinking the unionists, you and Bill Clinton oh. and various other people. Um, will this agreement be sunk if a number of unionists, a majority of unionists, don't vote in favour of it? Well, or will it carry on? Because Dr. Paisley well, clearly thinks it's sunk if that happens. Well, first of all, uh, you know, we've heard from unionists throughout the existence of Northern Ireland that the will of the majority of the people of Northern Ireland is what matters. And that's central to this agreement. And I don't know what that man means when he talks about hoodwinking, because as we've said repeatedly, and if you read the agreement you'll find this, we've said repeatedly that given that we're a divided people, and that is our problem, victories for either side are not a solution. What we have in this agreement is the respect for both identities and the accommodation of both identities and the creation of institutions that respect both identities and allow them to work together. And our hope is that by working together, we will build the trust that has been absent in the past. Because the more that people get to know one another in this part of the yeah, world, but my question, even though they're, 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 the accident yeah. of birth is that they're born in different communities. My question was, if a majority of one community, the unionist community, yeah. rejects this agreement, is it scuppered? Uh, the, this agreement is being put to the people of Northern Ireland. If a majority of the people of Northern Ireland reject the agreement, it's scuppered. Yes, but if the majority of the people of Northern Ireland pass it, it's not But if a majority of unionists get into an assembly according to this agreement, they can frustrate it in every way because you have to have, as you've just eloquently explained, well, the agreements of both sides in parallel. Well, well, so if you lose the unionists, you well, lose well, the assembly. Well, first of all, I don't want to lose the unionists, as I've been making No, I understand here. that. And, but the, the and, Paisley thinks you will and, lose them. And, and in, in the coming to this agreement, we made clear uh, that this is new thinking. I have said repeatedly we're living today in a post-nationalist world. We're all together in Europe at the moment, and this is what I don't understand, Ian. Uh, the British and Irish governments sit together with German governments and Italians, etc., taking decisions Indeed. about Northern Ireland, and we have no say at all. And now we want to get in there and have a say. And he says, no, it's going to somehow undermine Northern Ireland let's, people. Let's That's join, a load of nonsense. Let's join Wendy Austin in Newry to comment on that. Well, our first point comes from Peter McAvoy, who's a local businessman here. Uh, Wendy, I would like to commend John on the Trojan work that him and uh, the other party leaders who have brought us to this point, but especially John, who's been there from the beginning, from the early days here in the 60s, when he came to this town to help set up Credit Union, a town which at that time had 29% unemployed. John was there for us then. He's been there for us for the last 30 years. I would love to know if the people on the no camp have any answer to the situation that will arrive should they get their way in that uh, work that the likes of John Hume has done in attracting European funding and pledges to here in the order of some 300 million ECUs. I would like to know what the, the no camp are going to, uh, what their alternative is going to be if that sort of funding slips away from us because we slip back into 19th century politics and so the sectarianism that has dominated the past. You're a big John Hume fan, obviously, and uh, Rory Hughes up here. You're a, a committed European. Uh, does, does John Hume and, and what he stands for in Europe, is, is that uh, up your street too? Well, it's realistic because if, you, if the folk goes no tomorrow, then that basically means that the unionists are saying to the rest of the international community, we can't look after ourselves. We're incapable of governing ourselves. Therefore, industry will not come here. If we can't get together then through um, sitting around the table, of course we're not going to get investments and we're not going to have control of our own future. That's what they're saying. We're not able to, and it's, it's silly. Kevin Byrne from Sinn Féin. Now, you've been listening to John Hume as well. He hasn't appeared on any parties with your party, or any platforms with your party leader, has he, in this campaign? Uh, no, and I find it very hard to quantify the depth of uh, his party's nationalism. Um, I believe that the SDLP see this document as a, an end game and don't support in any way the Sinn Féin analysis that it will lead to United Ireland if pushed hard enough. Good point there, David. 
John Hume, um, picking up on that point, uh, the British Prime Minister uh, said in a speech in a room full of young people, I don't expect to see a United Ireland in the lifetime of anybody in this room, which would have you and me and him well dead before a United Ireland. You're accused there of not really being a serious nationalist. Do you expect this to lead to a United Ireland in, well, your, in your lifetime? Well, first of all... In your lifetime? Yeah, well, let's look at the meaning of these words. The, if a United Ireland means the taking over of one piece of earth by another, that will not solve the problems of this community. As we in the STLP have made clear from the very beginning, our real problem is not the line on the map called the border. No, but it's, it's his problem. Deep, hold on. No, but, but it's his yeah, problem. Yeah, but I'm answering him. Let me answer him. It's a deep division among our people. Mm. And the line in the map wouldn't be there if there weren't a deep division among the people. And if we have to solve our problem, we have to solve that deep division. And the way to solve it is to create a healing process, but as we have said, and create a framework within which that healing process will take but place. But Tony Blair... Hold on. No, but let no, me but Tony finish. Blair means one government, one island with one government. Yes, and that's what the Sinn Féin... Uh, yes. member there but, feels. But, but you, I'm you, telling you what, this question. I'm not you, dodging the question. I'm telling you what I want. Well, do and you I'm want saying, one government? I'm but saying, do you want one government you, for the island of Ireland? I want a solution to the Irish problem and I'm telling you how to get it. Not necessarily with you, one government. I, just listen to me, would you? Not please. necessarily with would one Would you government. please listen to me? I am listening to well, you. I'm then, trying to well, get well, you to answer my question. Let me answer you. If you get a framework for the healing process, and the two sections of our people start working together for the first time instead of quarrelling, then you break down the barriers. And out of that will evolve the new Ireland. And the model of that, it will be based on agreement and respect for difference. And the model of that will probably be very different from the traditional ones, but it will be a completely new Ireland. And, as I've said repeatedly to the public, our approach is modelled on our example of Europe, where the peoples of Europe have created European Union uh, after centuries of slaughter, by, by creating a healing process, by creating institutions well, some that allowed whether them... they've achieved a European Union on, at this that stage. ...that allowed them to work together in their common okay. interest, and that new Europe has evolved, and the Germans are still German, and the French are still French, as I've said repeatedly. And the Northern Irish will still be if, Northern Irish, if, and the Southern Irish, Southern Irish. We are not going to solve our problem by the flag-waving of the past and seeking one flag to defeat another. We are going to solve it when we heal the divisions between our people and the way to do that is through this agreement, creating the framework which will allow us to work together, spill our sweat, not our blood, and break down the barriers of centuries. John Hume, thank you very much. Let's go thank to Carrick Fergus for a last comment on what uh, Mr Hume was saying. James McCauley, were you reassured? Um, Mr Hume speaks very eloquently and expresses many fine sentiments. He expresses them in sound bites that don't really add up to much. Um, in the past, his actions wouldn't have given me much reassurance if his actions in the future um, are in line with his so-called new thinking, then maybe I'll be more assured, but I want to see his actions first. So, Barbara Smith, do you think that John Hume could say anything tonight that would help you feel more sympathetically towards a yes vote? Um, I think that we must be guided by what the agreement says, and what John Hume tonight has stated is that he is on for achieving Irish unity through the north-south bodies with executive powers. This talking about Europe, are we, I think we're moving towards a federal Ireland and his way of achieving it is to take um, the focus away from consent of the people to the transfer of power to this setting up of the north-south bodies which will achieve de facto unity. Well, what do you make of this when you've heard all these points and criticisms of John Hume? Well, I, th I think it's um, par for the course. Um, I mean, uh, John does sort of say one thing which means well, uh, something to one person and something to another. That's I mean, politics, I, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and he's, he's a consummate uh, person to do that. So not. do you trust him? Um, on a toss-up, probably not. Um, but <laughs> um, all, all I can say is I would hope that um, he acts out James's sentiments, that, that he does um, support um, da uh, uh, David Trimble and, and works for, for the, the constitutional parties. There's too much danger from cozying up with Sinn Féin rather than the Ulster Unionists. Correct. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. David. I'm joined lastly by Robert McCartney, the leader of the UK Unionist Party, uh, who is also urging a no vote tomorrow. I want to look ahead with you, Mr McCartney, to what happens if there is a no vote and it's carried. We've heard the weight of opinion from the uh, United States, Bill Clinton, from the British Prime Minister, about the economic damage that the younger generation in Ulster will suffer if they say no, because people will not invest here if they think the gun is coming back into Irish politics. How do you reply to that? 
Well, of course, I think this is a, a sort of um, economic threat that's being imposed. It's being suggested that if we, the people of Northern Ireland, do not go along with what others in other countries decide is best for us, we will be uh, made economic pariahs. I listened to Paddy Ashdown, whose party doesn't organize in Northern Ireland, hasn't a single voter here, come over and, and treat us to this uh, sanctions. Uh, Northern Ireland, despite uh, serious problems, has uh, done very well indeed. I think the figures for 94 and 95, uh, when the uh, level of violence was still continuing, uh, our increase in productivity and exports was second only yeah. to, uh, to East Anglia. But, but if you want to get foreign investment, you must know that people want a, a Northern Ireland where there is peace and they think peace is guaranteed and they believe, don't they, that a yes vote is the guarantor. Well, am I being, is it being suggested, David, that um, uh, the delegates of armed terror in government, prisoners released onto the streets, uh, all the other uh, objectionable features of this agreement are pr uh, prices that we have to pay in order to get multinationals to invest money here. Which is likely to bring peace, yes or no, tomorrow? I, I think that uh, that depends on the gunmen because we are told that if we say no, there will be a return to violence. I ask the question, from whence will this violence come? Because you see, all the parties with a capacity for terrorist violence are curiously enough, David, in the no camp. Sinn Féin, Provisional IRA, UDP, UFF, PUP, UVF. And so yet, these, these people are saying, if you don't express a yes vote and carry this effectively, I'm sorry, old chaps, we'll we just have to go back to give you a taste more of the, uh, the bomb and the bullet. And maybe after that you'll see a little uh, of our democratic sense. Uh, so I find it a paradox that those who are advocating a yes vote are in fact the, the major uh, components of, of violence and any future and yet, threat. And yet you heard David Trimble at the beginning of this program saying that he wants a yes vote, but he does expect decommissioning to start. Well, I, I think that, that is, is, is the biggest and most fraudulent statement of all, because uh, David Trimble said that he would not enter these talks and would not negotiate a settlement unless decommissioning commenced. We observed the British government resile from every position it took up on decommissioning. If one looks at the first paragraph in the section on decommissioning in this agreement, it refers to a declaration on the 24th of September 1997 which made decommissioning during the course of negotiations uh, an absolute requirement. But you're saying it won't happen even after. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. You're saying it's not going to happen even if there's a yes I, vote and this agreement I, is... I implemented. say that if there is a yes vote, decommissioning will be buried, and it will be buried for the following reasons. The Prime Minister and the British government cannot unilaterally vary, alter or amend a multi-party agreement without the consent of all of those other parties. What will happen is that there will be a lot of stringent and strong language referable to parties, but not referable to armed prescribed organizations. But I'm sorry, let's just be, be blunt about this. Are you saying that if the people of Northern Ireland vote yes, the arms are not going to go away and they're going to stay there and they'll come back onto the streets? Y and it's more likely that that'll happen if I, people I say have, yes I, than if they say I no? I have absolutely no doubt that if the IRA are permitted to retain their weaponry and as both they and Sinn Féin are committed as their ultimate objective to Irish unity as and when it is necessary to accelerate or progress as they call it uh, the, 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 the route to that ultimate objective they will apply violence as and when it is necessary. All right. let's, but, hear, let's hear a reaction to what you've said so far from Carrick Fergus. Well let's see if it's as pessimistic a view from Trevor Griffin. No, I'm not pessimistic. I think Mr. McCartney and Dr. Paisley are very negative about the agreement. I think they've chosen to focus on particularly emotive issues. The one flaw in both of their arguments is that they haven't produced a, an alternative. Yes, they, they have their own opinions, their own, their own views, the, the things they want to see, but it's not a credible alternative. 
It can't produce a cross-community consensus. It can't produce agreement in this divided land in which we live. It isn't a way to move forward. You just don't feel they're simply being realistic and pointing out the realities of this. I, I think Mr. McCartney puts his finger on some of the points that give a lot of us trouble. But, but we're voting tomorrow on a balanced view. And on balance, I think this agreement does more positive things than negative. Therefore, I'm willing to vote yes, because Mr. McCartney hasn't produced an alternative that can produce consensus in our community. Well, let's look towards Mark Wilson, because you run a hotel here in Carrickfergus. You want the economy to boom. Yeah. Does it boom more under a no vote or a yes vote? I definitely think that the economy will boom more under the yes vote. Um, Influx, again, going back to the 1994 situation, I mean, the influx of tourists under the first uh, ceasefire was phenomenal. I mean, look at the hotels that have been built and are constant, constantly been built in the province over this last uh, three or four years. So and, Bob McCartney's uh, wrong when he talks about the I, economy. Definitely, definitely. It, he's absolutely wrong because, I mean, it can be, do nothing but good, I mean, really. Um, take it, uh, the, the G8, they, uh, they said that there will be more money promised for, uh, you know, Northern Ireland, Clinton, everybody. All right. So, okay. Well, let's hear from David Simpson, another businessman. I agree exactly what Mr. McCartney has said, because IRA, Sinn Féin and other paramilitaries have spent almost 30 years bombing this country to pieces and murdering. And those people are now going to be elected into an assembly, holding on to their arsenal of weapons. Where is the peace in this agreement? Where is the confidence for the business people of Northern Ireland? David Simpson, thank you. And now to Wendy. Thanks, Diana. Well, there are business heads uh, in this room shaking uh, in disagreement with that. But uh, on decommissioning, Terry Gallagher, are you convinced that a no vote would move decommissioning on? Absolutely not. Um, uh, what's incensing me about this whole programme is the fact that decommissioning uh, and um, the past has been the main focus rather than the future and what this agreement means. Now, there is only one or two politicians mentioned the word future and what that can bring to this province, i.e. investment, inward and outside investment, um, employment for the people of this province, democracy and equity, which is what we should have been talking about all night, and also an end, hopefully, to sectarianism and a human rights commission, which this province hasn't had before and which made us second-class citizens of Europe. Geraldine Donoghue, Bob McCartney says that this is uh, economic blackmail. Yes, I just listened to Mr McCartney there, and as someone who professes to come from a democratic tradition, who is a parliamentarian of some repute and some, uh, in his own words, considerable intellect, I'm quite amazed that he again avoided David Dimbley, Dimbleby's opening question about what is Northern Ireland going to do if we're rendered with a no vote tomorrow. And I smiled somewhat to myself also when Mr McCartney very quickly lined up the Yes campaign with the paramilitaries and talked about the UDA, the IRA. He himself, may I remind him, is lining up with the most extreme paramilitary factions in our community, like the Continuity IRA, the LDF, the INLA. They are in your camp, Mr McCartney. So finally, I would put to you again the question that you avoided with Mr Dimbleby. Tomorrow, this agreement, you are a politician, you know about consent. This agreement has the consent of the international community, the UK government, the Irish government, the political parties here. And tomorrow, when I know we will get a yes vote, what are you as a politician, what have you got to offer? What's your alternative? I'm sorry, Mr McCartney, we haven't heard it here tonight. Geraldine, thank you. I must just say that the dissident Republicans here feel that they have nothing in common with Bob McCartney. Back to you, David. Well, um, Mr McCartney, you heard two voices there, yes, one sir. from Carrick Fergus and one from New York. both saying, what was your alternative? Well, well, before I deal with that, let me deal with the hotelier from Carrick Fergus who talked about the increase in business after the 1994 ceasefire. I acknowledge that. But what was the result? Whenever it appeared that the democratic process was not offering Sinn Féin IRA what they wanted, they bombed the hell out of Canary Wharf and Manchester and murdered two community policemen in Lurgan. So the price you pay for the increase in his hotel receipts is dead policemen on the streets and dead people in Canary Wharf in London. But Sinn Féin says that is over. You heard Jerry Adams talking about this and talking about I, this I, I, a, I really, a I really, step. I really think that uh, that is a tale from Hans Christian Andersen or the Brothers Grimm to suggest that that is over. If it is over, why do they have to retain their weaponry? Why did speaker after speaker at the Sinn Féin Ardèche commend the joint policy 
at Sinn Féin's our dish, the joint policy of the Armalite or the bullet as right. well as the ballot All box. Right. And what about the other point then that was made that I mentioned at the beginning, that you have no alternative, that you say no to this agreement, but that you and Dr. Paisley of have, have nothing? Of course I have an alternative. Uh, Scotland and Wales are being offered uh, democratic devolution under the, the usual rules. I, am, I want every nationalist citizen with his aspiration to have exactly the same rights, to have exactly the same protection as I would wish for myself or my family. I'm determined on, on a, a pluralist solution. The alternative to having the delegates of armed terror in government is to have them not in government. The alternative to have murderers and psychopaths on the street is to let them serve the sentence lawfully imposed by law after due process of trial. The alternative to having quangos is to have responsibility return to local councils over education, housing, planning, and a host of other matters. We can have all of those if we deal with the gunman, but we can have none of those if our children and the future is to be threatened with the sort of behavior, the corruption of democracy. We are getting peace under this agreement on terms, and those terms are that morality justice and the rule of law are to be sacrificed upon the altar of political expediency. Right. Robert McCartney, thank you very much indeed. Well now, before we close, let's hear just one last time on all the uh, conversations we've heard with all five politicians. Let's go first of all to Wendy Austin in Newry. Wendy. Ruth Sutherland's been listening very carefully to all of this. What do you make of it, Ruth? Well, the response to my um, comment earlier was that there was a contradiction, but I think the contradiction lies completely with the no camp. Whether we, I, my children are British citizens, Irish citizens, or European citizens, they have a right to live free of fear, free of sectarianism, to live in a peaceful and stable society where equity is present and democracy rules. That's what I want. I'll be doing my bit by voting tomorrow, working at a local level, and the only way we can achieve these things, these rights, is to work together, and we have to look to the future to do that. Do you agree with that, Peter McAvoy? Very much so, Wendy, and uh, I would again say to Mr McCartney, uh, if we get a no vote tomorrow as a result of his endeavours, I think we take a step backward into the 19th century instead of going forward into the 21st, which is what we all want for our children and for ourselves. Brian, uh, you obviously agree with that. You're a businessman here. Are you being economically blackmailed? I think we are by the no campaign. I think Mr McCartney and Mr Paisley aren't telling the truth. I think they should come clean and say it boils down to one thing. A no vote spells economic suicide. A yes vote means maximum investment and maximum opportunity. We haven't unfortunately been able to hear from everyone here tonight, but uh, it's time now to hand to Carrick Ferguson, Diana. Much hope, Stephen McAllister, for peace in Northern Ireland after tonight. I've heard nothing uh, from the politicians that changed my mind that uh, we should have a no vote. Uh, I definitely think that uh, the guns have to be taken out before we can get down to peace. And I would like to say to Mr Adams, the only reason the RUC has guns is because him and his supporters keep shooting him in the back. Absolutely. Diane Compton, you're a unionist, but do you fear that a united Ireland might be on the cards ultimately if a yes goes ahead? Um, I think you're reading between the lines if you can find United Ireland written anywhere in the agreement. But I do think what it secures is, if the people of Northern Ireland eventually do want a united Ireland, that will get it. And after all, that's democracy, and there's nothing to fear in that. David Strange, do you think people in Northern Ireland are safer if a yes vote goes ahead? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, David Tremble has said that the union is secured in this agreement. The 1920 Act of Government, which establishes Northern Ireland as a part of the United Kingdom is gone. And I want to say this to those who, uh, those unionists who are in the yes camp, do they really believe that uh, the SDLP, if the SDLP thought... Well, okay, I'm going to have to uh, leave you there because I want to get to Fiona McKinley, whose school organised a mock referendum, and the result? That's right, the result was 53% of the pupils voting no, 43% voting yes, and... 4% spoiled votes. I hope it's not the same tomorrow. Thank you very yeah. much indeed. David. Thank you very much. Well, that ends this special programme on Ulster as Northern Ireland prepares to vote later today on its future.
Question Time will be back next Thursday from Birmingham. In the meantime, from Diana Medill and Wendy Austin and me here in Northern Ireland. Good night. If you'd like to participate in the debate on Ulster, you can do so now on Radio 5 Live by calling 0500 909 693.